It was May 27th of the year 1990, and it was around 3 a.m. in the morning. The sun-filled vacation destination Wildwood was filled with people from around the state and country. As the place is a warm vacation resort, people were spending their time enjoying and partying. 20-year-old Susan Negersmith was having a great time, too. But it didn't take long before the boardwalk of Wildwood wasn't fun anymore. At least, not for Susan. Her partially clothed body, battered and left for dead, was found in the morning behind a popular restaurant called Schellinger's. What could have happened to this 20-year-old girl who was just visiting Wildwood for Memorial Day? Was it homicide or something else? Welcome back to Cold Case Files, where we bring you the stories of the most notorious cold cases in history. Today, we are looking at the cold case of Susan Negersmith, which was finally solved in 2022. Or was it? Let's find out. But first, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please hit the subscribe and like buttons. Now, without further ado, let's take a walk through this twisted cold case. Wildwood is a resort city in New Jersey, filled with award-winning sandy beaches and world-class boardwalks. It is an ideal family destination to have a fun weekend or a vacation. It is also a place with a bustling nightlife. But the peculiar thing about Wildwood is that it has a crime rate of 1 in 16, which is more than 99% of the communities of New Jersey. And this unfortunate cold case also took place in the resort city of Wildwood. Susan Marie Negersmith was born on December 30, 1969 in Carmel, Putnam County in New York. She was the third child of Kent Negersmith. Her father remarried on March 29, 1986 to Colleen Barker. Susan had two siblings and one step-sibling, Michael Negersmith, Don Stegel, and Emily Negersmith. Susan was pursuing her education in a New York State college, and she completed her second year from the college in February 1990. As an outgoing person, Susan always made her leisure time worthwhile, be it hiking with her father or exploring the corners of the Adirondack Mountains where her father had a cabin. According to her loving father, Susan loved hiking, just like him. She was a former cheerleader. She used to be one of the most enthusiastic cheerleaders in college, according to her friends. Susan had an interest in skiing as well, and she started skiing from a very young age. She was very good at it, and used to ski competitively as well. That says a lot about Susan and how outgoing she was. Kent Negersmith, Susan's father, also expressed in his own words how much Susan loved the beach and the way she enjoyed the freedom of the bright blue ocean. Susan also enjoyed hanging out with her friends and often enjoyed going out on Saturday nights. Her brother Michael described his sister as fun. According to him, it was always a time full of enjoyment when he was with his sister. She was just a hazel-eyed, brown, hairy, spunky girl, and she liked living her life to the fullest. But her promising life was soon about to change, and that change was waiting to devour all the hearts of the people who cared for Susan. It was May 26th of the year 1990, and the warm city of Wildwood was cooler than usual. According to People, that Saturday night was around 57 degrees. The nights in Wildwood are filled with youth enjoying themselves and drinking the night away. People usually visited Wildwood for a party vacation, and consuming large amounts of alcohol was usually a part of the party. And that night was no different. People from different parts gathered and packed the boardwalks, pubs, and bars. Among those people was Susan with her friends. According to a witness, Susan and her friends had booked a motel nearby and had some late-night drinks, getting quite intoxicated. After the party, Susan bid farewell to her friends around 11. People saw her being escorted by a man. The man appeared to be around 20 years of age. But in the early hours of Sunday morning, Susan's battered and bruised body was found behind a popular hotel, Schellinger's. The events of the previous night weren't exactly clear. Another description of the story was that her friends last saw her around 8 in the evening on Saturday. She left with a man, drunk and intoxicated. But those two stories were not the only stories from that unfortunate day. A stranger believed that he had met Susan that Saturday night, and he even wanted to escort her to the motel. But eventually, he left her in the area where she was found dead. 
When later he was asked if Susan could have been a victim of sexual assault, he replied that she was too intoxicated to be capable of consenting to sex. All the stories were quite different from each other, but they led to only one scenario. Her dead body, which was partially closed near a garbage dump. Her faded blue dungaree jacket was lost, her pink t-shirt was lifted, and her black dungaree jeans were wrapped around her ankles, according to the police. If the first story was true, with whom did she leave, and for what purpose? If the second story is true, then who were the so-called friends she went to party with that night? And if the third story was true, what happened after the man left her near that restaurant? There were so many questions, but all were left unanswered. There were so many stories and reports, but what was the real scenario? Susan's body was found on Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. by two employees of the restaurant Schellinger's. According to the reports, the police estimated that Susan passed away at 3.30 a.m. on May 27, 1990. She was found near a dumpster in an alley behind a popular restaurant called Schellinger's. Schellinger's was famous for its maritime theme and wide variety of classic seafood. It was located on 3516 Atlantic Avenue in Wildwood. Her body was found in an agonizing condition. Her clothes were partially removed, and she had bruises all over her body and blood stains on her chest. She showed clear signs of being a victim of some sort of sexual assault. Her feet were clean, which meant she did not walk there. One of her teeth was also chipped. With the superficial evidence of 27 external injuries, signs of an assault, and bruises, it was ruled to be a homicide. An autopsy said that she was assaulted before she took her very last breath. But after the medical examination of Susan's body, the cause of death was changed to accidental. After the second autopsy, a small silver glass was found in Susan's anal cavity. Dr. Mary Ann Clayton even found semen in the victim's body, but she never mentioned it until later. On further examination by medical examiners throughout the state, a suspect's DNA was found vaginally and under Susan's fingernails. Collection of many DNA samples was done, but they did not match any profiles within the system. The medical report stated that the alcohol level in her blood was 0.285%, which was over three times the legal limit at the time. World-renowned forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Baden listed 26 points of trauma and declared that Susan had suffered from mechanical asphyxiation and that her death was accidental. Although asphyxiation requires nonspecific external force to decrease the level of oxygen flow in the bloodstream, the attorney's office refused to elaborate and denied that strangulation or suffocation could have led to the death. In the end, the cause of death remained accidental due to heavy intoxication. However, Susan's father, Kent Negersmith, was not about to accept this fate. He believed that his daughter was a victim of homicide, and he had no doubts about this. Kent knew in his heart that he had to do something to get justice for Susan. Kent Negersmith was a senior scientist for Bayer Corporation in 555 White Plains Road in Terrytown, New York, before he retired. He was 42 years old when he first heard about his daughter. He was at his cabin in the Adirondack Mountains in northeastern New York. He was informed by his son-in-law through a phone call. Kent drove 180 miles to Cape May County Courthouse from Westchester County to visit the hospital. He could not imagine who could have done such a thing to his daughter. He knew his poor daughter was a victim of homicide, but that was not what he wanted to hear at first. After burying Susan under a pink granite heart in Raymond Hill Cemetery, the broken-hearted father promised himself that he would not give up and would continue his fight for justice till he drew his last breath. At first, the case had been treated as a homicide, but within a month, it was changed to an accidental death by the county coroner, Dr. John Napoleon. Martin Towey, a lawyer who represented Susan's father, told him that it would be difficult to question any suspects and pursue the investigation, as the first thing the attorneys would do is point out the cause of death on the certificate. So changing the cause of death was a big priority in solving the case. Taking the words of Towey seriously, Susan's father, Kent, sent out to try to change the cause of death. Susan's father Kent was not going to rest easy till he found answers. He appealed to the court to re-examine the cause of death. 
Even though the May County coroner and medical examiner denied his request to change the cause of death on the death certificate, Kent never stopped fighting for the justice he wanted to give his daughter. Kent even took a brave step forward to ask for help from the governor. He knew his daughter very well and didn't believe that she had gone out to party with strangers. According to him, Susan enjoying herself with her friends on a Saturday night was normal, but going out with complete strangers was not possible. Kent even offered a $25,000 reward for information leading to the conviction of the perpetrators of his daughter's death. Kent, after being denied by the medical examiner to change the cause of death, traveled across the state to find new results. And it was doing this that he caught a lucky break. While at a business convention in Texas, Kent took a bus to San Antonio to meet Dr. Vincent DeMaio, a board-certified forensic pathologist. Dr. DeMaio examined the reports thoroughly and had a totally different conclusion than that of the other examiners. According to him, all of the evidence he had seen in Susan's data pointed to a homicide and not an accidental death. He was sure of his findings that Susan was murdered. He agreed to provide his own report in order to help Kent. Kent met with more examiners and doctors, and everyone came up with the same conclusion, that Susan was a victim of homicide and her death was not accidental. With a new ray of hope and Dr. DeMaio's report, Kent was ready to face the Cape County officials and change the cause of death on the certificate. Finally, after three years in 1993, a new prosecutor was named for Cape May County. The new prosecutor, Steve Moore, had the same outlook as Kent. A lawsuit was filed, and it led to a review of the case and re-examination of Susan's preserved larynx was done. During those three years, from 1990 to 1993, before Kent had any medical reports to support his statement, many medical examiners were involved in the case. Dr. John Napoleon was the lead examiner in the case. He declared confidently that the cause of death was accidental, and after the declaration, all other examiners involved concluded with the same result. But now, in 1993, a Superior Court judge was asked to replace former Cape May County Medical Examiner Dr. John Napoleon with Dr. Elliot M. Gross. The change of the former prosecutor and the medical examiner really gave new hope to Kent and the rest of the family. In April 1994, Cape May County hired a special defense attorney in connection with a lawsuit intended to change the official cause of death. And in May of the same year, Kent filed a complaint in Superior Court to change his daughter's cause of death in the certificate. Dr. Elliott later weighed in, and after five and a half years, Susan's death was officially declared a homicide in 1995. A bone was found broken in Susan's larynx by Dr. Elliott, which changed the course of the case. According to Cape May County Prosecutor Jeffrey Sutherland, many law enforcement professionals and investigators were involved in this case. Many private detectives were also closely studying the case, but closing the case was harder than they thought. The press of Atlantic City continuously covered the case, and Yvette Craig was the lead reporter who covered Susan's story closely from day one. Susan's half-sister Emily was also a central character in this search for justice. She was only two years older when her sister Susan passed away. Although it happened a long time ago, and she does not remember much about her sister, Emily is now 34, and she still has vivid memories of the suffering they went through. Emily was very heartbroken, and she believed that Susan, in no world, deserved to face what had happened that night in 1990. Susan's sister Dawn believed that the officials wanted to hide the truth so that Wildwood did not suddenly see a decrease in tourists. The state police investigators also inquired about hundreds of youths residing in West Virginia who were in Wildwood on that very weekend but to no avail. To find a lead, many men who were of interest were asked to provide blood samples. Among them, the first suspect was Thomas Wolfe, an ex-resident of Wildwood, but he was found not guilty after his DNA sample showed that he had no relationship with Susan. Three forensic pathologists, including Maryland's medical examiner, provided opinions for free, and the New Jersey Crime Victims Law Center took hold of the case. A resident of CIL City in New York, Terry Downey, questioned the coroner's findings and protested why it took so long to find out what really happened, as it was so obvious that it was a homicide and that her father was right all along. 
According to the Cape May County Police report, Susan Negersmith drove to New Jersey with six of her friends for Memorial Day that fateful weekend in May 1990. They checked into a Wildwood Hotel, which was located at 2700 block of Atlantic Avenue. The evening was spent partying, drinking alcohol, and smoking marijuana. Later that night, at around 8 to 10 p.m., Susan left the motel. She then visited a gym during the midnight hours. The report continued saying that she left with a man she met in the gym for a party at around 2 a.m. on Sunday morning. She was then seen on the porch of a nearby house, according to the police reports. The police were told by the witnesses that she was very drunk, throwing up, and couldn't even speak properly. She even rebuffed advances by a man. They also included that she refused a ride home. Some officers also saw Susan walking unsteadily on the street accompanied by many men but the police left after talking to one of the men. Another witness told the police that he offered to walk Susan back to the hotel, but she was too drunk to tell him the location of her hotel, so he left her leaning against the restaurant Schellinger's at about 2.30 a.m. The next morning, Susan's body was found behind that very restaurant. As the cause of death in the initial stage was declared accidental, it caused a problem for the investigators to prove otherwise and even Susan's father struggled to get this changed for many years. After the cause of death was changed from lethal cardiac arrhythmia to hypothermia due to alcoholic intoxication and exposure to homicide in 1995, many suspects were found. But the case went cold again after this due to a lack of suspects. But later, in 2018, new technology had developed which breathed new life into the case. It helped the investigators to match the DNA profile of the suspect. In 2018, Emily, Susan's sister, traveled to Cape May County to meet with Prosecutor Jeffrey Sutherland to discuss the potential for a new avenue of investigation, something called genetic genealogy analysis. I will never stop for my, the rest of my life until we can, we can find someone. During the initial investigation, STRDNA, or the short tandem repeat DNA, was found in the victim's body, but had failed to match any suspect's DNA. But late in 2018, with the new knowledge of DNA technology, the major crimes unit of the prosecutor's office started a genetic genealogy trace of the DNA profile. And with much encouragement and sincerity from Emily, the Cape County prosecutor, Jeffrey Sutherland, the STR DNA testing finally got a match. After the genealogy investigation, they found the DNA, which the investigators had found at the scene so long ago, belonged to a man named Jerry Rosado. 62-year-old Jerry Rosado was a resident of Millville, Cumberland County in 2022. He was accused, and finally the authorities of Cape Town County arrested him on April 9, 2022. He was charged with second-degree sexual assault, which is subjected to imprisonment for 5 to 10 years by the law of New Jersey State Prison. The 33-year-old cold case was finally coming to an end, but sadly, Susan's heroic father, Mr. Kent Negersmith, could not be there to see his daughter getting justice. Kent passed away in 2016 still fighting for his daughter, and now rest together with Susan in the Raymond Hill Cemetery in Carmel. After being arrested, Rosado was extremely cooperative with the investigation. Rosado's defense attorney, Schenkis, even mentioned that Rosado was not a flight risk and was voluntarily providing DNA samples at the trial. Rosado had a past of being accused of other crimes like larceny, burglary, and joyriding, but Schenkis mentioned that those happened a long time ago and had nothing to do with what was happening now. According to him, the arrest of Rosado was neither justice to his client nor to the Negersmith family. Schenkis argued the DNA evidence also did not hold up exactly. He pointed out that DNA evidence often results in matches of one in quintillions, which is 18 zeros after the first digit. According to Schenkis, the DNA found under Susan's fingernails was a less certain match closer to 1 in 650, which could mean a match with many people in a community. Other reports that Schenkis went through consisted of files from the day of the incident that took place in 1990. Those reports stated that Susan had indulged herself in sexual activities with at least three other men in the 24-hour window before her death. 
The witness, who reported that he wanted to walk Susan to the motel but left her near Schellinger's, later stated that he also indulged in sexual activities with Susan that day. Emily Negersmith, Susan's sister, remained impassive in the court during the proceedings. Later, she said that she was not provoked or infuriated after hearing about Susan. What made her angry was denying the claim to the DNA match. Jerry Rosado, although arrested in 2022, was released in March 2023 after 11 months. A three-judge panel ruled on March 20, 2023, that the case was out of the law's jurisdiction date. It stated that the statute of limitations in 1990 required prosecution to begin within five years of a sexual assault, and the year 2023 was very late to fall under the same. It ordered a trial judge to order dismissal of the accusations against Rosado. With no further evidence that he was the killer, and after pleading not guilty, Rosado was released. The case remains unsolved, but now the authorities are more than confident that they will close this case once and for all. Rosado was not accused of murder, but for sexual assault. But as per the Negersmith family's emotions, Rosado was the criminal who ended Susan's life. The investigations are ongoing, but everyone hopes that there will soon be a conclusion in this 33-year-old cold case. The 33-year-old cold case still remains unsolved. Maybe this time, Susan's half-sister Emily will take the role played by her father. This time, all the questions might finally be answered, and then Susan and her father's soul can rest in peace. What do you think actually happened that night in 1990? Was Rosado actually the killer? Share your opinions in the comment section. Please like the video and subscribe to our channels for more interesting cold cases. We will very soon come back with new episodes on Cold Case Files.